Joining us this morning now, we have Tushar Cooper, advocate at the Bombay High Court, joining us to weigh in on the legal aspects of this, and aviation analyst Amrit Pandurangi to give us a sense of where he thinks this stock might go in the days to come. Uh, Mr. Cooper, thanks very much for speaking to us this morning. Let me try and get the legal perspective from you first on how you think SEBI will view, uh, you know, these rights embedded in the shareholder agreement and also in the articles of association, uh, what Rakesh Kangwal now calls unusual rights and whether SEBI is likely to have any objection to the way these unusual rights have played out over the course of the last few years, given that SEBI has so far not invalidated the shareholder agreement, nor disallowed for these rights to be embedded in the Articles of Association. Okay, we have two issues here. One is as to whether or not these, what you term unusual rights, is something which is uh, offensive to what SEBI would consider uh, valid and tenable. In my view, such rights which are reserved under the shareholders agreement and which have been embodied in the articles can and ought to be upheld. However, if in the implementation of those rights and in the exercise of those rights there is wrongdoing, SEBI can and would undoubtedly interfere. Now, therefore, the question is whether Mr. Gangal has raised tenable issues which SEBI can look into and seek to pass suitable directions to resolve those issues. I believe that the issues raised by Mr. Gangal <coughs> are substantial and should be looked into and I believe SEBI has in fact asked the company for a response to the issues raised by uh, Mr. Gangal. So to the extent whether such preferential rights are valid, according to me they can uh, be incorporated in the articles and they have in fact been approved by the uh, shareholders prior to the joining of the shareholders under the IPO. So that I don't think is a real issue. Uh, in fact, <coughs> preferential rights are exercised by many other uh, corporate entities. Recently we've seen uh, this issue play out in the uh, Tata Sons drama. Uh, but if exercising those rights leads to uh, diversion of funds or uh, mismanagement, etc., there are recourses and remedies apart from SEBI also available to Mr. Gangal to approach the NCLT for redress. So effectively it comes down to whether these related party transactions uh, procedurally or substantively were irregular enough to draw the re regulator's attention uh, and therefore would that prompt SEBI to intervene and relook or review these rights as Mr. Gangwal has called for. Is that the correct interpretation, Mr. Cooper? Absolutely. And I don't buy into the argument of the Bhatia group that merely because they reflect a very small uh, percentage of the turnover, they are insignificant. Because obviously, the turnover in the airline industry is huge. And um, as the uh, turnover increases, it's possible that the proportion of these related transactions uh, reduce. But that is not a consideration which can or should um, weigh in dismissing these allegations as insubstantial. I assume then that EY, the EY... I'm not saying that the allegations are correct. I'm saying the allegations... Sorry, what? I'm saying the allegations are serious enough to warrant an inquiry. I would imagine the inquiry, if at all SEBI asks for one, given that you've pointed out uh, that they have asked Indigo or Interglobe Aviation for a response, that inquiry would then examine the scope of the EY report, as Paiswani just pointed out, because Mr. Gangwal has raised issues uh, with the thoroughness of that report and the fact that that report has not been shared with all board members but only been shared with the chairman of the board, and that SEBI would do its own independent assessment of these related party transactions. Uh, you know, that, is, that, is that within SEBI's, uh, let's say, you know, gamut of powers uh, to actually do, which is to assess whether these RPTs uh, were, you know, in some way either misgovernance or, or bad? I, I believe that NCLT would be the more appropriate forum mm. to uh, carry these issues to. Um, and undoubtedly there appears to be some cloud uh, on the EY report given the fact that it has been uh, refused to be shared with board members. I can't see any justifiable rationale for that course of action. And um, that itself gives rise to some um, element of doubt as to the scope of the report, what the report says, 
and um, there do appear to be conflicting statements emanating from what was stated earlier about the related party transactions and which is now being conceded by the chairman etc so I, I mean it's a gray area and unless one has all the full facts before uh, you you can't really comment on that yeah so i think that was my question as well that would it be sebi that would actually review these related party transactions or would it technically have to go to the nclt i believe paiswani has a question connected to this Yes, uh, Mr. Cooper, you made an earlier point that SEBI, you know, can look into these RPTs. To my mind, these are slightly, uh, you know, different issues. Uh, I'll club them into different buckets. One is the issue of controlling rights that Mr. Gangwal has raised, and the other connected issue, but independent to it, is the RPT issue. At what point can SEBI use the RPT issue to then go into the AOA and say that hey, these rights are in fact unfair? That is one. And if uh, uh, your view on can SEBI do that, and if SEBI can't do that, can the NCLT, if this case reaches there, look at the uh, articles of association and then sit in judgment of the rights that the shareholders agreed uh, when the company was founded? I don't believe that SEBI uh, will look into the issue of those preferential rights which the Bhatia Group hold. Because according to me, there is nothing uh, infirm in such preferential rights being accorded. It is any wrongdoing which is thereafter performed in the exercise of those rights which can be the subject matter of scrutiny. So I, I don't believe that SEBI is going to have a relook at those articles at all. It may seek to delve into the allegations of the related party transactions, corporate misgovernance, etc. Because there is nothing wrong in having a um, um, rights uh, embedded in one group to uh, nominate directors. Ultimately, the airline was founded by them. They have the relevant expertise. And shareholders who subscribed uh, in the public issue were fully aware of these rights and did so on the basis thereof. Okay. So I don't think that that's something which SEBI is going to interfere with. Okay, Mr. Cooper, I have one last question to you. Now, uh, Rakesh Kangwal has also requisitioned an extraordinary general meeting of shareholders in which he's asked for shareholders to vote on two resolutions. One, which is to enforce the code of conduct of this company, uh, including the provisions which have to do with the fact that RPT should not you know, ordinarily be entered into and should only be entered into if unavoidable or absolutely necessary. The second resolution he wants shareholders to vote on is to recommend to the board a whole set of protocols or safeguards in signing related party transactions. Now, he has made the legal distinction that he originally wanted shareholders to mandate to the board that these safeguards be put in place. Then he realized that mandating this would require a special resolution, or so he was told by the Bhatia group. And hence, that special resolution, which the Bhatia group could have blocked, would have not worked in his favor. So instead, he is now asking shareholders to recommend this. But recommending to a board that has been fine with these related party transactions, can that have any persuasive power whatsoever if shareholders were in fact to vote in favor of Mr. Gangwal's resolutions? Okay, uh, before I uh, answer that question, my view is that given that the requisition was issued to the company, the company ought to have acted on that requisition and <clears throat> left it ultimately then for the shareholders to pass whatever resolutions they felt fit in their discretion. You are absolutely right that such a resolution, given the fact that it was uh, only a recommendation, would not be binding on the board. But to your question as to whether it would have persuasive value, it ought to have persuasive value and if, it, uh, if the board did not act on the basis of those recommendations, it could perhaps strengthen the Gangal uh, group in any action which it then desired to adopt before the uh, NCLT uh, in any grievances which it would raise uh, against the Bhatia group. So I, I think that yes, um, the resolutions would have a persuasive effect. It would uh, bring into a public domain uh, the issues which are being raised by the, uh, uh, the Gangal group and uh, would perhaps uh, act in some way to restrain the Bhatia group from uh, disregarding those uh, recommendations. All right, fair enough, Mr. Cooper. As you pointed out, the company should have called this EGM, but it chose not to, which is also one of the concerns that uh, Rakesh Gangwal has raised. Uh, now it does seem that based on his requisition, an EGM date will have to be notified. Uh, I think within the next few days, I would imagine the company will have to do that. So we'll know then 
uh, you know, what happens is the next step and eventually, you know, shareholders will have to vote on these resolutions if we do get to that milestone yeah. as well. Uh, but that's the broad legal framework. I believe the next big question to ask is on the stock impact front. Yeah, and, and whether the business takes a bit of a uh, issue as well, Minka, as you pointed out, that maybe there could be operational issues that could come in. And Amrit Pandurangi looks at that very, very closely. He's an aviation expert. Amrit, thanks for being with us and thanks for um, uh, listening into this conversation. What do you think would happen to business for Interglobe Aviation as it stands right now over the course of the next three to six months if this matter were to linger for that long? Certainly seems to. Yeah, see, business uh, certainly will uh, take a significant impact because, uh, you know, the attention of the key people in the management is going to be on this issue or these issues rather than what is happening in the market. And uh, not only the market deserves a continuous uh, focus, uh, but the competition will take full advantage of the fact that uh, the key people's uh, focus has been taken off the market uh, for a few days or a few weeks. Uh, and uh, they will take full advantage. Uh, so definitely there will be a market impact. Now, whether that impact is uh, uh, a kind of a temporary impact uh, that will last for a few weeks or months and then they will come back with a full attention on the market or not is uh, too early to say. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, anything that happens in the market will get somehow reflected in the stock market. Uh, I am not an expert on uh, stock market because we all know that it is not just uh, how the company is performing in the market that matters to the stock market. It is also all other issues, including this corporate governance issue itself. Uh, even if nothing happens in the market, uh, the corporate governance issue itself will have an impact. Uh, what impact it will have, positive, negative, uh, or uh, volatile, etc. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, clearly, uh, in this market, both for the domestic uh, segment as well right. as the international segment, uh, it is very crucial that... Uh, the owners and the key so, uh, executives of uh, uh, the company are focused on the market. True. And let's assume that they are trying to do that best. But Amrit, one final question on this. Would you reckon that uh, there could be shifts in market share that we could see? Because Jet is grounded. Interglobe has these issues. We, I mean, Air India, we all know is Air India. Do the other players stand to benefit as a result of this? Is it, or is it too premature to talk on that? No, I think other players will benefit temporarily, definitely. But whether they'll benefit in the slightly longer run, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, and uh, whether they'll benefit more in the domestic or uh, more in the international is difficult to say because, uh, you know, each each of the other players have their strengths and uh, attention on different segments of the market. Uh, so the, you know, uh, almost unbridled continuous growth of uh, Indigo to achieve the very high market share uh, may take a kind of a small hit. Uh, whether they will come back, solve these issues uh, in whatever manner, bring it to a closure within uh, you know a couple of weeks, and then carry back uh, into the carrier attention back into the market is uh, anybody's guess. But I suspect that uh, this will go on longer than that. Corporate governance issues are never simple to deal with, and so to that extent, uh, the competition will benefit uh, for uh, quite some time.